Hello everybody, I'm Dan Jackson, aka Danzy Engineer. In this video, we're gonna be talking about an introduction into fire alarms. I was very fortunate enough to be asked by Schneider to put together a presentation and webinar for their Facebook group, which is the Electricians Group powered by Schneider, so check it out. And I believe this webinar is gonna go on the My Schneider app as well. So I thought I'd put this on my channel because it's gonna be quite handy. Now this video um, webinar is it's mainly designed for electricians who are thinking about working on fire alarm systems, but actually it gives you a nice insight and introduction to fire alarms. So anybody who might have even an admin role or isn't quite from the industry moving into the industry or just interested in general, and we talk about legislation, installation considerations, competence, and route into the industry. I hope you find it handy. If, As ever, if there's any questions, please let me know, put in the comments below. And I'd be really appreciate if you could share this if you find it handy um, on your social media, because it helps kind of get the word out and I like to help people as much as I possibly can. Some of the audio might be a little bit iffy because um, when I was recording, I was setting up some new technology. I've moved into my office now, so um, I'm all set up and all good. Um, I hope you enjoy, I'll speak to you soon. Hello and welcome to this webinar, and also known as Danzi Engineer, and this is the Electricians and Fire Alarms, an introduction to BS5839 Part 1, powered by Schneider Electric. My name is Dan Jackson, and by trade I am an electrician, and I then trained to become a fire alarm engineer. And this webinar is it's an int introduction. We're not going to go into too much detail on the design of systems, or how you install them as such. It's more of an overview and it's stuff that a lot of electricians come to me and ask and how they apply that knowledge. Now there's lots of courses you can do online. There's lots of training you can attend to and that's why I don't want to go into too much depth. It's, it's looking from above and insight into it. Now bear in mind, I've done this journey. I've, I've trained as an electrician and then I got into fire later on. So I'm trying to make this a little bit different and make you think about a few things before you start doing fire or if you are already doing fire, kind of uh, focus your perspective on some really important items. What we're going to be going through today is three sections, but after each section there's going to be a little bit of time that we can do a little Q&A, ask some questions and if there's anything throughout the entire webinar please contact me afterwards, I'm more than happy to help. So we're gonna be going through legislation, installation considerations, and route into the industry. And it's gonna be a few common themes throughout the whole webinar, and it'll become obvious as we, as we go. We're gonna go on a little journey, okay? Now, we are the electrician. We're electricians and we wanna start installing fire alarms. Now, I hear all the time, Electricians say, of course I can install a fire alarm, it's just a cable from A to B. It's much more than that, okay? It, and this is what I want to take you on a journey. And there are necessary steps and understandings of how we do things to get to that point. Fire is something that is backed by legislation on how we manage it in buildings, and we are part of that. And I need to really make you understand how things work because you don't want to be in a situation where you are being blamed for something. So we are the electrician. Yeah, we have potential necessary skills to start doing fire. There's a lot of opportunity in fire, but I really need to drum it into you about respecting fire, what it does, understanding the law, standards, understanding fire behaviors as well. You need to understand that Fire safety isn't just fire detection alarm systems, it's such a broad topic. We've got firefighting equipment, you know, extinguishers, um, suppression systems. We've got fire engineering in properties, fire evacuation, how do we get out? Emergency lighting, signage, there's so many aspects to fire safety. Electrical forms part of it. We install systems that can catch on fire. And we also have to mitigate certain aspects to stop thermal effects of cab cables because we've we've all seen electrical fires or potential to start electrical fires competence 
competency is really, really big. Okay, just because we're electrician doesn't mean we can do fire alarm systems. I need to drum that into you. You are not competent at fire alarm systems just because you are an electrician. Yes, it is a step towards it. One of these steps that I've just shown you, okay? But competence is really, really important. Professionalism and how we do things. Um, we all have to protect our trade. We need to be professional. We can't be cowboys, we can't be chancers. We need to protect our trade so we can charge the money that we, we deserve. Otherwise it just gets watered down so that anybody can do it. It's the same as electrics, okay? So we need to be professional in how we do things. Investment. You can make good money out of fire, but it's more of an investment to create yourself work, regular income. And as you've already got these fantastic skills of electrician, there will be an investment required to get into fire. It is different. And obviously ongoing development, we need to continuously develop. It's the same as when you train as electrician, that day you get you train as electrician, that day you get your gold card does not mean that that is it. OK, a lot of people think that that is it. It's not. It's not like getting it's exactly like getting your, your driving license. I mean, you get your gold card and that's it. You're you're out on your own and you can drive how the hell you like. But we all know that within this trade, within this game, we need ongoing development. I'm constantly doing CPD. I'm constantly doing courses. Um, regulations change all the time. We all know that. And it's very important to understand that we need to completely refresh our skill set and train more and more and more. Now, if you put your middle finger up at all of this and say, up yours, right? Situation. Of course, we have fires here. We have fires. We end up with all this absolute dog crap work, all these cables lashed in, cowboys, right? We end up with non-competent work, poor systems. And, you know, a lot of the time people think, oh, it works okay, so it's okay. No, we need to understand more about fire, what we're trying to achieve here. And worse still, guys, we could be responsible for somebody's death, right? You need to remember this. Fire, fire kills people, same as electricity, fire kills people. Who is the law? What is the law? Is the building owner the law? Is the main contractor the law? Is the bloody architect the law? No, this man is the law. And you need to remember this face throughout this whole webinar. You need to remember this face because you do not want to end up in front of him explaining yourself. When someone got injured, someone died, you don't want to have to explain to this guy and try and back up what you've done when you haven't done things correctly. And this is, again, what I'm trying to drum into you today. What, I mean, there could be a scenario where you end up in front of this person and you want to be able to have your defense and say, yep, I put my hand up, I've done everything I possibly the law there's different legislation in place this points us towards having to install fire alarm systems or fire safety systems in general and how you manage fire the big one is a uh, primary legislation the health and safety at work act which lays out what employers should be doing to ensure that people are safe and obviously any any Every time somebody goes against that, you can be prosecuted. It's the law. We've got the regulatory reform order. Now, if you're working in fire safety, this is the one we need to know about. This is the one a lot of us work to um, and applies more. I mean, more than one legislation works, applies to life safety and fire alarm systems. But the, the RRO, as it's known, is something that um, if you're working with fire alarms, you need to understand it. Now, all of these documents here, you can go on the gov.uk website and you can download them. They're free to download, you don't pay for them. I like to have things electronically um, simply because it allows me to search very easily PDF documents um, and reference parts and extract parts, but you can, you can print them as well, which they allow you to do. The electricity work regulations, now that does apply to fire alarm systems. We, part of a fire alarm system is the main supply. Of course it applies. You know, we still have to carry out safe isolation and, and it's, you know, in how we work on live parts, it's dangerous. So this also applies to the alarm guys who aren't from electrical background. You know, they need to understand the electricity work regulations when you're changing a fire alarm panel, safe isolation on the mains, it still applies. In fact, in the British standards, it does mention the electricity work regulations. And then we've got the approved document B, 
which you have volume one and volume two. Volume one is buildings uh, that are dwellings and volume two is buildings of the other than dwellings. Now this relates to fire when building regulations apply for extensions, new builds and so forth. Now we've we've got all this different type of legislation and how it kind of points towards having to, the need to install fire alarm systems. We don't want to end up in this place. There are prosecutions, people have gone to jail, people have been fined. We don't want to be the person who ends up in jail and it can happen. So before you start taking on fire alarm works, have a little think about this because as, as soon as you exchange money with a client for doing some works, there is a level of liability and responsibility there. There's something you just always need to think about. You need to, even if you are the electrician getting the fire alarm people in, you need to make sure that they're doing things correctly. So you, as the person taking the money, are not in line here to go in this dock. So it's something, do we? We, we just don't want to be that person at all. You need to be familiar with what's what this is. I mean, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know what this building is? Are you aware of this? You should be, okay? This is Grenfell. And on the 14th of June, 2017, 72 people died in this building. It was horrific. I remember the day. I remember what I was doing. I remember what I was thinking. There's other fires that have occurred and do occur. Um, there's some very famous fires. And um, we don't want to be part of the failure in this as the electrician or as the fire alarm engineer. We don't want to be part of this whatsoever. We need to make sure that everything we do, we can go to bed at night knowing that we can sleep easy. Because if I was maintaining a property like this or installed a system in a property like this and this happened, I'd be pooing my pants a little bit. So, you know, it's um, you need to make sure that that judge that we showed you the face of, that you can stand up and say, I've done everything I possibly could. There's some big opportunities working with fire alarms. Obviously we got the money, come on guys, we all do this. We, we all like earning easy money. I, I honestly believe I personally have made some good money, more money out of fire than I have electrical. Um, I, but obviously, it's about doing it correctly. Um, we don't want to do it for the quick buck. And I think the real reason for opportunity is to be the angel in disguise. You might look like this. I don't know. Good on you if you do. But I believe we are here to save people's lives. And that should always be the forefront of everything we do. We're saving lives. It's a life safety system. And you have to really think about that. And, and it really, really directs your focus, really, if we think about the angel here opposed to the money. The money follows, okay? We can do a good job, be professional, and we can earn good money at the same time. There are some very greedy people out there, greedy organizations that think about the money first and don't think about the angel. So I uh, please be the angel. And Now what happens if there's a fire, depending if somebody's hurt, if somebody died, or you know there was damage to the property, there's, there'll be an investigation. Now, obviously, if somebody died, they'll be they'll be looking to prosecute somebody, but there'll be investigation if it's an in if nobody died, for example, and it just damaged the building. I've been involved in a lot of these by insurance companies. They might pay out um, to the building owner and then the insurance company will obviously do their own investigation to try and nail it on. Some blame game. It's just a complete blame game. And they'll do anything they possibly can to blame somebody, to take them to court, to prosecute, put somebody in prison. If it's insurance based because it's a uh, property that's been damaged. I mean, there's been some massive. I mean, look at uh, no, it's not in the UK, but Notre Dame, for example, there'll be some massive blame game going on there. So you need to make sure this is this is the thing when we work in electrical, we should be doing this anyway, but documenting everything we possibly do and making sure our paperwork is utterly watertight and electricians in general isn't at all. With fire, we need to doubly make sure that everything is documented. So for example, when somebody comes to you with an inquiry and a specification, no matter how simple it is, 
you need to document that. So you need to think about how you store that information and how you can gain access. I've always had a folder system on Google Drive, for example, that any job, whether I just do a design or whether we do the full installation and the maintenance, or whatever, we create a project folder and we record all the correspondence, all the information. And there's obviously software out there that can help you with this, but we really need to be getting into the realms of documenting things correctly because all that happens in that investigation is it goes back. So for example, let's say you are on site and verbally with the architect or whoever, you somebody made a change in something and it was all verbally agreed. We need to make sure we're getting that in writing before it's instructed because it might be something really simple. You've been asked to move a detector that's too close to say an air conditioning unit and now it's not effective because the air blows the smoke away from the detector. You might as well not have one in the room. There was a fire it caused and then there's a blame game. Who was that? They'd say to you, if, they, if it wasn't documented, that the client requested it there, they'll be going, why did you install that there? And the client will be going, well, yeah, why did you install that there? We didn't tell you. And because there's no documentation to say that, you're gonna get a blame. That's how it works. It literally works. There's been an instance in a blame game. I'm not gonna name the property, but basically it's quite a high profile fire. Nobody died, but the place burnt down. It cost hell of a lot of money. The main structure was still there and they put it down to an electrical fault of a main switch burning out, failing. It burnt out and what happened is the fire spread in this electrical cupboard. It spread from the electrical cupboard up the riser and eventually, before you know it, the whole building was on fire. Now, the main switch was out of its manufacturer's warranty, so they got off. So then the insurance company tried to blame the installer. They'd gone bust many moons ago. Then they tried to blame the um, electrical inspectors who had, had tested it. And they kind of got off because there's no, there's no evidence to suggest that they would know it was faulty at the time. I mean, arguably, if they'd done um, thermal imaging, then maybe. Um, so then what they tried to blame was the fire alarm company. Why didn't the detection go off? Well, it did actually. And there was proof, there was evidence to prove that. Then they discovered that data cables had been run throughout the building. And what happened was, is that they wasn't sealed throughout the fire compartmentation. And then the, the data cable guys managed to get off because they said, well, it's the building owner's responsibility to make sure that we have all the information about the fire compartments, which they didn't. So then they managed to nail it on the lift company who installed uh, a riser throughout the entire building. And basically th there was a specification to say that they're supposed to fire seal, um, compartmentize the entire lift shaft and they didn't, they got nailed. That's how it works. It's just a, a complete blame game. Who can we blame? Who can we charge? Who can we send to prison? That's how it works. A lot of people think it won't happen to me. It won't happen to me. I hear it all the time, it won't happen to me. Wrong. It happens, okay? There are, if you Google and search online, fire alarm contractor sentenced, gone to prison, there's stuff that pops up here. And this is just one example of basically a guy who's been prosecuted because he wasn't car carrying out fire alarm maintenance correctly. I won't read this whole article, but the point is here that the, the work he was doing, the maintenance was substandard. He wasn't highlighting issues that he should be highlighting. A little bit more closely here, where I make them fine glass. According to the prosecution, Christopher Morris, I oh know Christopher Morris, an electrician, electrician who taken over the maintenance of the system in 2006 had issued several annual certificates of worthiness to the care homeowner. Now, what I read in that, without looking into this too much, what I read there is that he's been issuing, issuing certificates to say everything's okay when it's not. And there was an investigation and he was found to not be doing things correctly, probably to the British standard and highlighting about fire alarm system because you might take over a fire alarm system all day long and saying, oh yeah, it's absolutely fine, it's absolutely fine. But if you're not noting the defects or any uh, problems with the system to the building owner, then again, who's going to be in the dock if something goes wrong? And there are prosecutions, obviously on this one, nobody died, but there's been a prosecution. Now, if you're a sole trader and, you, and you've been stung with a six grand bill, it's pretty nasty. If you're stung with a bigger bill, for example, you're in a limited company, that can cause you a lot of problems with your business and cash flow. You don't want to be that in that position. We need to understand here the RRO, the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order 2005. Get familiar with this document, read it. It's not a big document. And in fact, there's only one tiny, tiny little part on fire detection and alarm systems 
However, you need to understand that this is the legislation, the secondary le legislation that we are faced with in fire safety. And you need to know this article 33, defense. I'm gonna drum this into you by the end of this uh, webinar. Did you take all reasonable precautions? That is a question to you as the installer, the maintainer, the designer, the person who commissions, whatever. Have you taken all reasonable precautions when you're installing this system, when maintaining this system? Can you stand in front of this man, hold your hand up and say, this is my defense. I've stuck to the British standards. I've stuck to government guidelines. I've stuck to codes of practices. Can you stand in front of him and say, yes, I've done all that things. And he'll be like, okay, fair enough. You know, you need to be able to ask yourself, did I take all reasonable? I'm gonna bring you back down to earth. I've probably scared the absolute bejesus out of you um, talking about law and you're gonna go to prison and everything else and be prosecuted and won't be able to feed your family, um, be responsible for people's deaths. Um, anyway, we're gonna go back down to earth and what actually happens, you know, you as electricians, you get asked to install fire alarm systems I can't ask you to install fire alarm system. Now, there's going to be different reasons for that. It might be that you're doing an extension and, you know, they've got to apply to um, building regulations. It could be that they're having a refurbishment. It could be that the insurance, building insurance, it could be because they've had a fire risk assessment. Um, sometimes they don't actually have a bloody clue. Um, there's a lot of clients out there, building owners, who aren't very clued up on everything we've just gone through. So that's why I think it's really important to understand legislation and how this whole process works, because it's it's important to know and you can advise your clients and give that sort of added value as well. Um, but, you know, a client comes to you and asks you to install a fire alarm system. Now, bear in mind, we've just gone through the reason for this is usually fueled by legislation and you know, just quickly going through this, we've got new builds, refurbishments and extensions. There'll be build, building regulations, um, existing buildings, there'll be a regulatory reform order. So if a, if a client comes to you and asks you to install a fire alarm system, quite often there's a reason for that. And it's important to know, and we'll go through that next. Process to follow, okay, with a fire alarm system. And you need to understand these four different sections We've got the design, we've got the install, we've got the commissioning, and we've got the maintenance. So, yeah, you might be installing the fire alarm system, but it has to be designed. So when a, when somebody comes to you, if you haven't designed it yourself, then obviously there, there'll be somebody else who has designed it. Now, if there is no design, you might be asked you might be asked to design it, and it's really important to go through the next sort of slides and understanding. And bear in mind. Can you stand in front of that judge and say, yeah, I've done everything. I took all necessary precautions. Every fire alarm system has a design or should do. It is installed, it's commissioned and it's maintained. It's really important to understand that these are four different parts. You as electricians might just be the installers. And sometimes I find that's when the problems can come. The, the system might be installed very well in terms of the wiring could be fantastic because let's face it, electricians, that's what we do. We run cables in. You might do it better than what some of the alarm companies can do. That's fantastic. However, it's when you, you're on a site, you've been given a drawing by an architect and it's usually the installer who finds any problems, i.e. detectors need to go in certain places. If they're cl too close to any obstructions, that's the time that you point out to all necessary parties and say, this detector cannot go here because you've just changed the building design. They might drop, you know, you know how architects, they come in all fancy on a Friday afternoon. They're like, oh, and they change everything. It might be that scenario. And you as the installer need to turn around and communicate this to whoever, and they might have to rechange the design or agree a variation or make some changes to accommodate, okay? So sometimes I find it's the installers that fail. So you as electrician, without any competence in fire alarm installations, this is why I think it's important to have this additional knowledge, even if we just take this away and we go and do some additional training and all you're doing is the install. But you might also be asked to design systems. You might be asked to maintain systems. You might be asked to commission systems. There's four different parts. 
So when you're asked to design a system, you need to know what the system is for and really importantly, what is the category? We'll go through categories in a second, but often I find some clients don't give you a category whatsoever. So where it's uncertain what the necessity or the need for the fire alarm system is or the category design, there are some documents that the client can go to to have a look. We've got British standards 99999. We've got other guidance documents supporting fire safety legislation. Um, it might be insurance, but quite often in existing buildings, I would always say, what does the fire risk assessment say? So if it's an existing property, let's say, you know, a block of flats, three floors or whatever, I'd always say, you want me to design a system here. Please, can you tell me what the fire risk assessment says? Um, now, they, if they if we're following legislation here in the system block of flats, they should have a fire risk assessment because that's what the RRO, the it's legislation to say that that's what they should have. And what a fire risk assessor usually does is determine whether a fire alarm system is needed. Sometimes it isn't. This is the thing. It's not always needed, but the fire risk assessor will say what if it's needed and what the category is. Sometimes they don't always provide a category. And this is why you might have to go to one of these five to determine what the category is. And it's really relevant. Categories. Now, we've got different types of protection. We've got, I'm just gonna run through these two here. And I don't wanna go in too much detail on design because this isn't a design webinar, but we've got life protection and we've got property protection. Now, the reason we need to know the category is because are we protecting for life or are we protecting for property? Now, if you are asked to design a system, what you've got to bear in mind is that you are taking responsibility of that design. If you design the wrong type of system and you haven't been given a category or anything before that or a specification by the client, you might be standing in front of that judge if something went wrong. Fire alarm systems are not that straightforward. And when you start working in things like blocks of flats, you, you start to realize that they're really seriously not that straightforward. Even in retail units with flats above, it can be quite complicated. So you need to understand that design is a whole aspect, okay? It's not just a case of fitting an addressable system, a non-addressable system. The client needs to come to you with a category and tell you why. And if not, are you that person who wants to take on the responsibility of selecting the category? Ask yourself that because they are different and they serve a different purpose. Some of it's quite straightforward. Now, what I've seen a lot of companies, what they do is if there's no category given, they just do an L1, which is basically a high level of protection throughout, which is fine, but obviously it's more costly. It might not actually be necessary. So they can go to those other documents we looked at, like BS9999 and, you know, but really I think if it's an existing building, you should be asking, if there's been a fire risk assessment and you should be able to talk to the fire risk assessor and, and ask him about it because it, it, fire risk assessments are not generic. They cannot be. They've got to be specific to the property. And obviously you can go under guidance of the fire risk assessor because they assess the risk is, is what it says on the tin and they'll suggest what's required. I'm going to run through these really quickly. So obviously life protection, quite straightforward. We're stopping people from dying um, in, a, in a property. Um, property protection is to stop the property damage to the property. Sometimes you might require design for a combination of both, which is straightforward. I've worked in a lot of historical properties. They want to protect people from dying. They also want to protect the property because they're historical and you know, without them, they haven't actually got a business and can't generate income. It might be that the property is unmanned. So the detection is there for a property because it's got assets. It could be utilities. Um, you know, for example, like a water pumping station might have a plant room or something like that. They don't want it to go down because it's detrimental to, you know, society, I guess, because we, we're obviously pumping water to people's homes. So there's all different reasons. Now, where we've got life protection, we kind of start from the back. We've got L4, which is many call points and automatic AFD stands for automatic fire detection on escape routes. An escape stairwell so it's all the escape routes anywhere that you have to walk out of or through to get out of the building in the event of a fire then we've got l3 l3 is l4 plus rooms off the escape routes l2 is what we just said plus areas of high risk how do you define what is an area of high risk fire risk assessment somebody determines areas of high risk it could be plant rooms electrical intake rooms um, it could be bin stores, 
um, the reason I say that is because there's a lot of arson. You know, it's areas of high risk. That's where it's down to a fire risk assessor, not you as the electrician or fire alarm installer. And then we've got L1 where we've got manual points and AFDs throughout, basically everywhere. Um, and again, I'm not going to go, f there are places that you don't have detection and I'm not going to go into too much detail. This, this is the introduction. If you want to go away and do a design course, I suggest that you do. This is not about design. Then we've got a similar thing for property protection. I'm not going to go into it too much, but one thing I do want to highlight is on the side here, we've got alarm devices. OK, and if you notice here, alarm devices. Now, what this means is that just you might have an L4 category system where you've just got detection and manual call point on the escape routes only. But you might have a building that has rooms off the escape routes that doesn't have detection, but it still needs alarm devices, i.e. sounders. So even though we've got detection protecting the stairs and the way out, we still need to meet the audible readings and, and the necessary requirements for sounders within the bill, within the rooms that don't have detection. It's just something to bear in mind when you're selecting the type of system that you're installing. You have to have, a, you know, on life protection, we have alarm devices throughout. Now I had to get a Schneider board in here somehow and promote Schneider. So we've got an EZ9 consumer unit here. We're all familiar with Schneider, whether it's Act 9 EZ9, whatever. Um, but I'm just trying to relay this into simple terms on how what are you know what circuits are made up on a fire alarm system because you know we are electricians and we understand cabling it's just a different way of thinking so we've got our our consumer units the the protective parts we've got our system components here we've got an mcb and we've got current using equipment here we've got lighting now if we turn this into fire we put our fire we have a fire alarm panel. Here we go, nice fire alarm panel. Um, the picture was provided for me by Eurotech, who are specialist distributors of fire alarm systems. And then we've got our system components here. We've got detectors, manual core points. Now, bear in mind, these are current using equipment. Um, they all use current here. Now, bear in mind, a, a core point is basically a switch, but it has an LED on it with this particular one. So it, if it's got an LED, it will use current. And we've got cabling, we're all used to cabling here, and we've got batteries. So the biggest difference here is obviously we have a battery backup. I mean, you might install that on your electrical system as well, but you've, you've, we have a battery backup. It's a requirement to make sure that the fire alarm system is functioning if the mains goes down. Because what we don't want is there to be a mains failure. Some properties, I live in a rural property, um, and quite often we get power cuts. And you want the life safety system to function in the event of a mains failure. Now, what's really important to know is that we still have to do design calculations on cables and on battery backup for fire alarm systems, because there is a requirement. Again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but there's a requirement that the fire alarm system has to function for a certain amount of time. In the case of a fire and a mains failure has gone down. Now, that requires some design calcs, like I said, just like you would do design counts for your cabling, volt drop is exactly the same because if the volt drop is too much, obviously detectors won't work because there's a range that they work on, a voltage range that they work on. Um, and you'll find that sounders, for example, might not sound if the volt drops too, too much. So we have to design things. Now, what I see a lot of is electricians whacking in fire alarm systems. Oh yeah, I'm gonna put a twin flex panel up, blah, blah, blah. They, they put up a system or whatever conventional system and they just fit whatever comes from the supplier without any thought or consideration about what I've just described. And the system isn't suitable, it's not fit for purpose um, because they haven't done battery calculations. Sometimes the batteries need to be larger than what they come as standard, whatever the hell standard is. You know, the batteries come in different sizes and there's a requirement the bigger the battery, obviously, the bigger the load, it may power or duration. It's, it, there are some calculations that you need to be aware of when you're designing designing a system. This is the important thing, designing a system. And you just always got to remember when you're installing a fire safety system, what are we doing it for? What is the purpose? We're here to detect a fire and alert people in the event of a fire. This is what we're doing it for. We've always got to have that at the back of our mind. Why are we installing this system? Because if there's a fire, we need to maintain an integrity of the fire alarm system to alert people to keep them safe or protect the property.
always have to remember it. And because you don't want to be the person who stands in front of this guy, here he is again. Again, I want to drum it into you. And I want to point out this regulatory reform order, Article 33 defense. Again, did you take all reasonable precautions? So if you didn't do any design calculations for your batteries and the system failed because there was a fire and it only lasted five minutes or it, it died straight away because the battery wasn't big enough to take the load that was on it. Because bear in mind, we've got QS and current, which is the system working in normal mode. And then you've got alarm current. The alarm current's gonna be more. Sounders going off, beacons are going off, LEDs are lighting up. There's more current being used. So what does that do? Drain the battery quicker. Always bear that in mind. So can you stand in front of this man again and say, I've, I have my defense, I've done everything that is reasonable to make sure that the system was working in accordance with the code of practice and guidance, British standards, BS 5839 part one. Always ask yourself. There are different types of fire alarm systems. Again, I'm gonna kind of like breeze through this because um, I kind of think uh, it, we can go really deep into this and we just, we just don't really need to, but we've got different types of systems. So I'm gonna go through it quickly. We've got a conventional non-addressable system for wire. Okay, so, oh, there's a bit of cable missing there, but there we go. Maybe someone hasn't wired that in. Um, we've got, on a four wire system, we have sounder circuits that are dedicated for sounders only, um, you know, outputs as we call them. And then we've got dedicated zone circuits for inputs, detectors, manual call points, and they're not on the same. So sounders aren't, the outputs are not on the same as the inputs, they're separated. This is, these are typically quite older style panels. Obviously they still exist um, and quite widely used in cer certain circumstances. And I could talk about this forever, but conventional non-addressable two wire you know panels can look exactly the same as well this is the thing and these are for illustration purposes by the way all these detectors you wouldn't necessarily swap and match and whatever it's just purely to give a visual um now the difference between a two wire and four wire is a two wire you can have sounders on the detection zones and it just saves money in terms of wiring so um, when you're swapping over a system or you're installing a new system, it might be a more economical way in terms of less amount of wiring. But one thing you've got to bear in mind is if you're putting sounders on the, the zones, you're increasing the alarm load, aren't you? So if there's a fire and you've got to think about this because you don't want to overload the, um, the circuits because panels as well, every manufacturer is different. You need to understand that you have to work out what can be put on it. There's a lot of best practice stuff, but really, do we want to stand in front of that judge? We need to do our calculations when we're doing our design. Are you the designer? If somebody's designed it for you, fantastic, that's fine. You can install as per his or her design. But if we are designing, we need to think about this kind of We've got addressable systems. Now, you know, we, we are used to this. All of our uh, detection and sounders, they, they go on loops. You can diff different size panels, single loop, two loop, four loop, eight loop, 16 loop, you name it, you can get different types. Now, one thing's really important to kind of highlight here, and this is why I don't wanna go into too much detail because I can literally speak for hours on this, but manufacturers all function a little bit differently. Okay, some of them quite similar, of course they are, but even with non-addressable and addressable systems, you need to understand how the panels specifically work and what's the differences. Some panels, might only have a certain amount of sound, sounder circuits, additional sounder circuits. So when you're swapping over a panel, you you might want to do a like for like, or you might want to change it to something else, but you need to make sure what's on the system is compatible with what you're about to put in. You need to get used to speaking to the manufacturers and finding out more about their systems. And this is a massive difference with electrical industry and the fire industry is that we are really kind of, not tied to, but you have to build a relationship with the manufacturers simply because um, knowing their kit is really important. It really does vary. I'm not you know, familiar with every single type of manufacturer. I have my preferred where I've built up a relationship and I know the bits of kit really easy, but you get some people who are absolutely hot on certain types and fault finding on certain systems, but they work on a different type of panel and they, they're, they're clueless and it takes them too long. And we need to you know, make sure that yeah, whatever we're installing is compatible and the design is fine with the panel because not all designs are okay with certain types of panels. They, they, they all have their little quirks and differences. Video systems, 
becoming more and more popular where we've got devices out in the field and they're connected via radio frequency. However, what I will say is that these days, you tend to find they're not all completely wireless. You do need to wire parts of radio systems these days. Um, in, in, don't get me wrong, if it's a very small property and the readings are all okay, you might not have to. However, um, you tend to find what we, we have what's called a hybrid system. You might have to wire a network and it might have, um, what's the best way to describe it to you guys, transponders or whatever that talk to devices. So you might have to have additional bits of kit that talk to a group of devices. Years ago, we used to have systems where you could whack a massive antenna up, um, a transponder throughout a massive building, and you can just stick loads of radio devices. But the way things are and the way standards have changed, we, we tend to find even radio systems these days, we have to wire parts of them still, so not fully. But um, again, it's a good solution. I mean, personally, I like something wired. Um, there's more maintenance involved on radio because they have internal batteries. Um, but again, you know, sometimes the install cost is, is relatively low on radio systems because it's just a case of screwing a detector to the ceiling rather than cabling it. So there are other design considerations here. But again, you need to, I personally would say to uh, a building owner, I'd give them the pros and cons of a wired system to a radio system if they wanted to go down a radio but there's a different type of system for every type of property out there so it's pretty good and that's why you need to get the, to know the manufacturers and the different bits of kit if you are designing and installing to be fair i'm just gonna i thought it was important to put these in as well domestic smoke alarms now we're talking about part one okay now part one is commercial fire alarm systems and i see some people try and install domestic smoke alarms will it detect smoke of course it will however Part one doesn't really cater for these type of alarms. As good as they are, they're not necessarily suitable. So, and again, if you're if you're doing a variation from the standards, you need to be able, if you are that person who's making that call on that design, you can stand in front of that judge and go, yep, that's absolutely fine. So it's just something to be aware of. And you know, these can be, we know we can, some of them can be radio with uh, little radio modules. You can have them interlinked, hardwired, and these days we have fancy gateways that now talk to the cloud and send all the information so you can remotely look in at properties. But I thought um, we're, we're always to install any smoke alarms, um, but it is a different kettle of fish, if I'm honest. So um, but it's still a type of fire alarm system. It still does, you know, the purpose. Like I said, there's a lot of manufacturers out there that offer free training because of course they want you to use their kit over anybody else's and it's about build, building that relationship um, we all have our preferred bits of kit um, i'm not going to name any right now unfortunately schneider don't actually do any um, so they've not paid me to um, say this um, but yeah get, get used to the manufacturers contact them they all have sales guys they all have training some training you have to pay to go on but you know a lot of these manufacturers will do free cpd online obviously with what's going on with uh covid19 but um there's a lot of uh in-house training as well whenever that starts back up again so get to know the manufacturers and you know read their catalogs read their installation guides and stuff now a lot of uh, electricians really moan about the cost of the blue book that we have to buy 7671, but we have to work to it. And I find it crazy if you're an electrician and you, you, you don't have it or have access to a copy when you're supposed to install to those standards. But even more so with fire, I know so many electricians who come to me asking for questions about the British standards. And I'm just like, bloody just read it, man. And they're like, well, I haven't got it. And I'm like, you need to get it. If you're, if you're installing fire alarm systems, you need this standard. You can't work to it without it. And I know there, I know there's a lot of guides out there and stuff like that, but you know what? BS5839 part one is quite black and white. It's not that many pages and it's quite simple to read. It's far easier to read than 7671 far easier to read and again I like to have it electronically because I can um, do search terms and reference it and it's quite easy you might like to print it off it's up to you but a lot of uh, guys say to me but it's really expensive because if if you're buying it off the cuff it's a, it's a few hundred quid I believe um, and I, I do get that but you can't work on these systems without knowing the standards and we're going to go through some of the standards that I think are important to highlight but I cannot express more. You need to go away and you need to read this book 
5839 part one. Now there are some organizations, uh, trade bodies, voluntary bodies that actually do subscriptions. So I believe NAPIT do, um, where you pay like an annual fee and you get a certain amount of British standards relating to fire safety. Um, I know that the ECA do, um, NSI do, uh, the SSAIB. So just check with your scheme provider if they do do a scheme where you can have a subscription online because I believe uh, I, th I believe um, the SSAIB is like a hundred and something quid a year and you get a great bunch of standards and an annual subscription. So when they upgrade, you get the updated version as well. It's really worth it. Um, this, because again, if you used to stand in front of that judge and you've done something wrong, how can you justify to him if you haven't even got the British standards? Get to know them, read them. And I'm happy to go through with anybody if anybody's got any questions on British standards, not right now this webinar, outside of this webinar. I'm always happy to help and it helps my own CBD looking them up, but really please buy them yourselves and read them and understand them. The same as part six. Fancy 12 there, here we go. Some fancy graphics. So yeah, get to know them. And <clears throat> these two are completely interlinked. And I'll tell you why. In BS 7671, okay, there's a standard, 560.10, which basically says a fire detection and fire alarm system should comply with the relevant standard of BS5839 series. Okay, so basically what our blue book is saying is that when you install a fire alarm system, it does form part of 7671, okay? It does fall under it, it does fall under the scope, but then it points you towards 5839, part one. There are different parts within uh, BS5839. We've got part one, we've got part six. There are other parts as well, part eight, part nine, um, but we're just talking about part one, which is fire detection alarm systems in non-dwellings, if you like. And there's m multiple references in part one talking about BS7671, multiple. For example, I like to highlight this one, installation practices and workmanship. So when you've got fire alarm engineers who don't install cabling in a certain manner, how we expect as electricians, there's a stand here that basically says that's what they should be doing. It points towards BS58, um, sorry, it points towards 7671. There's, there's, you go in, par like in cycles between the two, they point to each other. So they're completely and utterly um, interlinked here. So it's just something. I just want to want to have a quick look at some of these standards. Now, there's there's a section in BS5839 Part 1, 26 cables, wiring, other interconnections. Now, so if you're installing the system, this is obviously relevant to this. So C, cable systems used for all parts of the critical signal paths and for the low energy, the low voltage main supply to the system should adequately resist the effects of fire. For most fire detection and fire alarm systems, standard fire resistant cables should be considered to provide sufficient resistance to the effects of fire with appropriate methods of support and jointing. I wanna highlight, highlight, highlight this. The, criti the critical signal path is the cabling or points between how fire is detected to how it is alerted. So essentially zones or loops for the detection and the sounders. And then also if we're connected to an ARC, an ARC, um, that path there, because obviously we're trying to get the fire brigade out. So it all forms part of the critical signal path and for the low voltage main supply. The main supply forms part of the fire alarm system and therefore it's saying it should be fire rated. So if you've got a fire alarm system that's got just twin and earth or singles in conduit or whatever, supplying the main supply for a fire alarm system, it doesn't meet the standards to, to BS5839. So when you've got electricians say, well, it's not my regulations, it's BS5839. We've just seen in a previous slide that 7671 points to part one and will say you then apply this. So it is completely relevant. So when you're doing your EICR, for example, and you find that a fire alarm panel doesn't have fire rated cable into it, and it's not, you know, installed as for, as per 5839, you know, we should be thinking about coding that really. That's what I think. And it's saying here that we should have fire resisting cabling. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but some properties that, you know, high rises, for example, might require what we call enhanced cabling, might be MICC or enhanced um, FP cabling or whatever. 
Um, but the purpose of the cabling is to resist the effects of fire with appropriate methods of support and jointing. What we mean here is, is that the joints that we make have to have a maintain a fire integrity. It can't just be in a plastic uh, box with just standard, I don't know, Wagos or something like that. We need to think about are the joints fire rated? Are they going to fail within and lose the, the integrity of the fire alarm system if there was a fire? Methods of support. There's obviously there's a big thing now about you know premature collapse. With fire alarm cabling, we do have that it applies because of seven six seven one. But what we also have is we want to maintain the integrity of the system. Now, if what you tend to do then is refer to manufacturer's guidance. So when you have fire alarm cabling that's clipped direct to the ceilings or something like that, and they've only used fire clips every meter, that potentially doesn't comply here because you might have a droop in the cable. We want to maintain the integrity of the fire alarm system. And a lot of manufacturers will turn around and say you have the metal clip or whatever um, as per their spacing table. So we tend to install metal clips throughout regardless. That's general practice. D, standard fire resisting cable should have a duration and survival of 30 minutes when tested in the corner. So most of the critical paths need to maintain in integrity for 30 minutes. That's that's generally standard. You know, there are some, like I said, there's some properties that require more than that. And there'll be instances, but we have to install fire. I mean, this, this surely this is obvious, guys. If we're installing fire alarm systems, we should be installing fire resistant cabling. It's pretty pretty simple. Cable should be installed without external joints wherever practicable. All terminations and other accessories should be such as to minimise the probability of early failure in event of a fire. Other than in the case of joints or within the system components such as control equipment, manual core points, blah blah blah. I'm not going to read that bit out. And the materials should withstand a similar temperature and duration to that of the cable. All joints other than those within the fire components should be enclosed within a junction box labeled with the words fire alarm to avoid confusion with other services. What we mean here is we need to, we need to avoid using external junctions, junction boxes, joining the cabling wherever we possibly can. So if we've got, if we've got a new installation, why are we installing junction boxes? We shouldn't be doing that. And the reason we do this is because that's where the failure happens. You know, that is literally where the failure happens, fault finding and, and so forth. And if you do have a junction box, we should be putting on it fire alarm to let people know that it is the fire alarm. We need to make sure that we let everybody know in the building that it's the fire alarm. You know what I mean? So um, the other parts here are basically saying that it's a bit crazy, but it might seem a bit odd. But obviously, you've got a manual call point and you'll have like a little plastic connector that clips into them. They don't have to be uh, fire rated. I'm not gonna go into why, but I just wanna highlight that. So, but if you do a join, you have to make sure that the construction of what you're using, the materials, maintain the fire integrity of the system. So long story short, don't use a load of cheap plastic stuff. K, to avoid the risk of mechanical damage to fire on cables, they should not be installed within the same conduit as the cables of other services. Where fire alarm cables share common trunk in a compartment of the trunk in separated from the other compartments by a strong, rigid and continuous partition should be reserved solely for the fire alarm cables. See, we're fire alarm installers, we're special, we get our own containment. To avoid electromagnetic interference with fire alarm signals, any recommendations by the manufacturer of fire alarm equipment in respect of separation of the fire alarm cables from the cables of other services should be followed. What we're saying here is, is that we need to separate the fire alarm cables to mains cables, data cables and everything else. They should have their own um, trunking containment and shouldn't be mixed with other stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. If we're going to depart, if you like, we call them variations in fire alarms from um, the British standards. That's fine, but there needs to be a justification. And whoever decided that variation needs to be able to stand in front of that judge and say, I made that decision. I'll give you an example in a minute, but um, it's OK to have a variation. But obviously, we don't want to minimise the purpose of what the fire alarm is doing. Otherwise, it's completely pointless. We might as well not have it. But when you've got a system that you're installing, and you've been given trunking and you've got mains in there and you've got, you know, or you might have a, a data section. This this recommendation basically says that fire alarm system should be separate to both of those. So just have a think about that. 
it says it black and white here it's very very clear oh all fire alarm cables should be of a single common color that is not used for cables of general electrical services in the building to enable these cables to be distinguished from those of other cir circuits the color red is preferred so it's not saying that red is the the requirement of the cable it's just saying it needs to be a common color that is different to other cables and obviously red industry standard is that color so just bear that in mind I have a lot of clients in the past that um, it's all surface click cabling, like in pubs, for example, and they just don't want red, which is fine. You know, a lot of time we might install black, but it's a variation. They, they've decided that and how you can mitigate that as a client, I guess, is by saying that anybody who works on the electrics or whatever has to have some sort of knowledge and understanding that the black cables might also be made, um, might be fire alarm cables, not just mains. So there's ways of, um, you know, of having variations, but generally speaking, we install red cable. It's just, you know, standard. H, right, okay. Except in particularly audacious conditions, mini insulated cable. Do you know what, I'm gonna read out the small bit here. Particular consideration should be given to all areas that are less than two meters above level, uh, above floor level. What we mean here is that Cables need to have mechanical protection in areas that may may have physical damage or rodent attacks. So generally speaking, when we install fire alarm cables, anything less than two meters, we install it in trunking, additional trunking or, or conduit or what have you. That, that's kind of standard unless there's a, re, a, a, a because bear in mind, if you're installing FP cabling, it's soft skin. It's, it's not got a strong mechanical protection at all. Just like twin and earth, you wouldn't install twin and earth clip direct would you in someone's house um, and you know there's risk for damage there we want to maintain um, the integrity of the fire alarm system here so generally a standard we install it in containment if it's less than two meters but there, there's other areas as well you need to think about um, the mechanical damage here just remember again why we install a fire alarm system to protect people stop them from dying protect the property and when there's a fire, we want to provide an alert. You have to remind yourself constantly why, when we're, when we're choosing to install cabling in a certain way, we're trying to maintain the integrity of the fire alarm system to provide a warning throughout a fire, from detecting a fire throughout a fire to get people out of the building. We always need to be thinking about that and those considerations when we're installing. And just a reminder, this guy again, are you doing everything that is re and taking all reasonable precautions? Always. Re We're familiar with obviously BS 7671 and the electricity work regulations. If you're not, you should be, um, you're an electrician. Um, and all we're doing was just, there are some similarities between the standards. We've just gone through 5839 and also um, legislation and regulatory reform order. There are some similarities between pieces so the electricity of work regulation says competence regulation 16 no person shall be engaged in any work activity unless he possesses such knowledge or experience yeah right we see lots of people working on systems that haven't got that but there we go it's uh, black and white there which has article 18 which says the responsible person must appoint one or more competent persons to assist him in undertaking the preventative and protective measures. So it defines competence. Again, in the RRO, competence is really important. I just wanna highlight what it says in British Standards 5839. A competent person is a person with the relevant current training and experience and with access to the requisite tools, equipment and information and capable of carrying out a defined task are you competent to take out maintenance works are you competent at designing at commissioning a system believe me commissioning is far more involved than what people believe it is so we go back here are we competent at these four sections you might only be competent at one or two of them or more so what we do here you might as the electrician you might get somebody to design a system. You might install it under their guidance. You might get them to come and commission it. And you might take over the maintenance if you're, if you're competent, but you have to ask yourself, are you competent at one of 
or you know all, all four of these sections just a reminder again about competence 3.12 competent person bs5839 part one so one thing i get a lot of questions of where does part one and part six end or cross over now i was doing a course a few years ago on passive fire protection and the lecturer lecturer was saying to me that he comes across a lot of people who are very confused about you know part one and part six and he says you know they're very straightforward you know one does this one does that they, you know there's there's no gray areas i actually disagree i think it can be confusing for a lot of people and we'll go through that now but part six is your domestic smoke detectors your non-commercial fire alarm systems and then part one is your obviously your commercial in non-domestic systems but i just want to run through the scope of each of these um British standard if you want to know what it includes go to the scope read the scope what does it do it'll tell you in the scope so in part one it covers the design installation commissioning and maintenance of non-domestic systems system systems comprising of only one or two call points and sounders to complex network systems incorporating automatic detection manual call point sounders and interfaces so what we're saying is, is that it could be one manual call point with a sounder and a panel, or it could be a massive complex system, you know, like a shopping center, an airport of detection and alarms. Also to provide a signal to initiate the operation of other fire protective systems, such as extinguishing systems, smoke control or door release. So our fire alarm panel system and system can give a signal to other systems to activate. It might be uh, we use our fire alarm system to activate activate a smoke vent to open up if there's a fire smoke comes out of the building or the doors release they're, they're, there's different standards for these um different disciplines as well there's so many british standards in fact so our part one does not cover those part one what does it not cover okay it doesn't cover the primary function when something is to extinguish or control fire such as sprinklers um, extinguishing systems it doesn't cover voice alarms voice alarms is another um, part of 5839 it doesn't cover 999 or, or 112 public emergency call systems or manual or mechanically operated sounders it also doesn't cover audible or visual guidance systems you know they are different you know if you've got guidance systems to get people out in the event of a fire or an emergency so it, in the scope it tells you what it covers and what it doesn't cover and I'm kind of like briefly going over. Part six. Okay, part six covers the design, installation, commissioning, and maintenance of domestic systems. Domestic, underline that word, domestic. Single family premises, flats, and multi story. So, part six with your domestic smoke alarms covers single family premises, flats, and multi story. So, like a, um, if you've got one family living in a, a massive mansion, that comes under part six. HMOs with a number of self-contained units, sheltered housing, dwellings and units with common areas, supported housing, um, self-catering holiday homes up to a certain size. What does it not cover? And this is the interesting bit. So it doesn't cover non-domestic systems. It doesn't cover hostels, uh, caravans, boats or communal parts. I've highlighted this communal parts of blocks of flats or masonettes. Now, this is where it gets confusing. So you've got a block of flats, say you've got four floors. The communal parts come under part one, but the internal flats, the actual flats themselves come under part six. Now, when you get a fire risk assessment, they will tell you a category. Quite often you'll get something that says LD2, LD3 for the communal parts, but LD is a category for part six. LD is not a category for part one. So sometimes you can get quite poor information from fire risk assessors, but it's just something to be aware of, okay? So communal parts comes under part one. Sometimes we get part one systems interface with part six and they overlap. This is where it can get a bit confusing. I'm not going into it right now because it's a massive topic. And your mind is probably blown. There's so much information here. Of course, in the Q&A, let me know if you've got any questions. Now, <clears throat> you might be asked to install a grade A firearm system. So um, in part six, 
you have different grades. You get a, a full fire alarm panel um, like we installed in part one, which is grade A. You might have a grade D, which is your typical sort of um, mains with battery backup detectors. And then you've got part um, grade F, sorry, which is your battery detectors. So there's different grades. When we deal with part one, we deal with grade A only. We don't deal with any other grades of system. So we're dealing with grade A. However, there'll be instances where you're asked to install a fire alarm system that's grade A. Now, when that happens, for example, you get a designer or an architect or whatever says it's got to be a fire alarm panel, um, you know, with a loop system or whatever. Now, if it's in like a mansion and it comes, it falls under part six, that's absolutely fine. You install a system, but what you have to do is if you've been asked to install a grade A system, you install it to part one. So you, you, you install a part one fire alarm system in a part six building. However, what you do is you swap the clauses out. So when it comes to the audible alarm, so um, the sounders, you don't use clause 16 from part one, you use clause 13 from part six. And it, basically it's just the sounder levels um, for sleeping areas and so forth. And this table is in part six. And manual call points, for example, in a mansion, you don't want call points on every landing and every exit of the building. That's going to be a bit ridiculous in this really expensive mansion. Um, so you you don't you you don't stick to clause twenty in part one. You go to clause eighteen in part six, um, and it's basically says along the lines of um, it's recommended to install them where you can, but it's not necessary to install them throughout like you would in a part one system. So you just swap the clauses out. Again, if you're working on a part six system, you need the standards. Now in part six, you've got a table, you've got table one, and these are different types of properties. So you, you just read this table here and you just have a quick look and you say, well, what is the building that I'm installing the system in and designing the system in? And as you'll see here, it will tell you if it's a new or um, a massively refurbished building, Here's the grade, here's the category. This is recommendation, minimum recommendation. If it's an existing building, here's the grade and the category. It's very straightforward. And what you'll notice here is that in particular type of buildings, so like a, a rented four uh, bedroom story house, it's saying that you should have a grade A system and it should be uh, an LD1 category. So in this instance, a grade A system, you would then go to part one, install it as per all the stuff we've just spoken about, with obviously um, different clauses on the sounders, um, people of hard of hearing, manual call points and that for, and, and so forth. So table one in BS 5839 part six, that's the one you go. So how do we get into the firearm industry, root into the industry? I wanna take us back to the original slide when I said we're going on a journey and we need to respect fire, we need to understand it, understand legislation, competency, professionalism, investment, which we'll go through in a second, and ongoing development. It's really important. Us fire guys, we don't want electricians coming into our industry and taking our work. Of course we don't. But obviously it's got to be done correctly. Okay, there, There's work for everybody out there, but it's got to be done correctly. And a, a lot of fire guys in this trade are fed up with people outside the trade coming in thinking that they can install fire alarm systems, especially electricians who think it's just a bit of cable and a detector on the ceiling. It's, it's far more than that. Um, and th there is a process, there's standards and, you know, there's a lot of systems out there that are really bad. So there's, um, yeah, there's, diff there's different ways you can get in. I just wanted to highlight this again, competence. Okay. A person with relevant current training experience and with access to requisite tools, equipment and information and capable of carrying out such tasks. Relevant current training, okay? Now, I get asked about training all the time. I'm literally not going to go on this topic right now because it's such a vast one. There's no single framework on what you should do training wise to get into the industry and what is deemed enough to be competent. Um, there's all different training providers out there. A lot of them are very, very good. Um, I haven't sat all the training, so it's hard for me to say. And the training that I've done personally doesn't exist anymore. It's been taken over by something else. So it's quite difficult. But I think I think you can't look at doing one single course and go, that's it, I'm competent. It's an ongoing thing. Experience. Now, you as electricians are in a great position because you're great at wiring cabling. And now because we've gone through some of the, the standards or 
more so I'm pointing to go and read them and do your own research and learn about them. You can gain experience for installing systems if you team up with a fire alarm company and you do the install, they do the design and commissioning and, and the maintenance and you, you're just getting used to it with the install under their guidance. That's how I got into it really. Um, access to tools. So this is what I want to talk about now. Like obviously, you, you know, we've got an aerosol can, it looks like a bit of deodorant. We can't be using certain stuff that we think that sets detectors off on, on detectors that can damage them. We You've got to go with accordance with manufacturer's instructions. So there are some, there's pretty standard test equipment out there, okay? Um, but you need to make sure that the test equipment that you're using is suitable for the detectors that are installed. So we've got detector test here. We've got different types of um, test equipment. So you get a can of smoke, which is, some of it is absolutely fine. There's some stuff out there that shouldn't be used, but um, you know, there, there are some very expensive poles that you can use, but they are cost effective. And actually you can misuse aerosol cans quite easily. Um, whereas these these bits of kit here, um, they only spray a certain amount of smoke, which makes it efficient. And also it doesn't contaminate the detectors. So it's something to think about. If you're, in, if you're doing a lot of maintenance, a lot of um, commissioning or something like that, you need to invest in the right test equipment and tools. They are expensive, but it, it does pay. I see a lot of electricians trying to fault find on fire alarm circuits with their normal voltage detectors. I mean, what on earth are you doing? You know, in, in the fire alarm game, we, we deal with different voltages, AC, DC, um, extra low voltage, low voltage. You know, we need the right test equipment to do that. And we need to get ourselves some multimeters that are uh, ideal for the job. Um, and of course we, we can use, you know, we still have to do tests such as insulation resistance so we can use our insulation resistance uh, testers and so forth. But you do have to acquire different types of test equipment. Sound meters, for example, just something to think about. You have to have the right tools to carry out the work and the right information. You know, this is, here's some standards. If we're, if we're working under the scope of any of these systems and we're installing them, we need to understand them and have access to them. I've gone through earlier about where you can get these British standards. But what I do with um, my team of guys, I make sure they've got access to the British standards. So there's no argument to say that they can't read things up themselves. And I encourage them to read them themselves. Honestly, I do. Um, so, you know, people need to have the information. I've also got a Google Drive, which has loads of manufacturers information that my engineers can access very easily. There's, you can go online, I guess, and um, there's a lot of stuff online, but I like to be able to control it. So, uh, you know, that's why I put it in a Google Drive. And if any anybody has any um, uh, useful information, any of the guys, yeah, we throw it in there, nice and simple. There's loads of standards. It costs a lot of money, guys. So yeah, uh oh, we've just gone through all our bits and pieces on fire and how it's not as straightforward as just installing a couple of cables. So I hope that it's given food for thought and it hasn't frazzled, frazzled your brain. But it, this, the whole purpose of this was to give you an introduction, an overview, to make you go away and think a little bit more about this. Um, I don't think you should be scared off. I, I did kind of uh, throw the judge at you quite a few times, but that is reality. Do you want to be standing in front of a judge or someone's family who somebody's died because of the failure of what you've done. Um, that's ultimately what's got to be at the back of our minds. But do you know what? It can provide um, good revenue. It can provide you with a good career. It's interesting installing fire alarm systems, but you need to go away and do your research. And remember this face, of course, remember. This. So thank you very, very much for listening to this webinar. Thank you to for Schneider for allowing me to provide this on the platform. I hope it's been useful to everybody. You can always get hold of me on my channels. I've, I'm on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, Instagram, and Facebook. And my handle is Dan Z Engineer. That's what I'm known as, Dan Z Engineer. Um, I have a fire alarm compliance company. I have experience. So I've been there, guys. I'm an electrician who's gone into fire. I've been on this journey. Thank you very much.